Welcome to today's live webcast on an overview of thermal imaging in the fire service. I'm Matt Schwegler with the Infrared Training Center. We've got Jason Messerschmidt and Andy Starnes joining us here in a few moments. Uh, before we begin, just want to cover a few housekeeping items regarding today's presentation. Go ahead and share my screen here. We've been asked by a few of you already if we are recording today's webinar. We are. Uh, the plan is to have this up for playback here a little bit later today off of our YouTube channel. If you go to youtube.com slash infrared training, uh, you'll see this recording and several others that are listed there under our infrared webinars. And I think the plan is to also push this out to you via email uh, later, probably early next week as well. Um, if you want to follow us on social media, we're active on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Stay tuned to these channels for updates on upcoming webinars that we'll have throughout the month of April, as well as special uh, announcements regarding other training opportunities from the Infrared Training Center. We've got our website for our courses in the U.S. and Canada at infraredtraining.com. And for those of you joining us uh, here from Europe, the Middle East, or Africa, irtraining.eu is where you can log on to find a list of courses in your region. I should mention before we begin here is that ITC is offering a tactical firefighting thermal imaging level one certification course. Uh, we don't have any public classes scheduled here at the moment, but you can lower the cost of training with an on-site class. If you want to learn more about that, please call Alex Crucial in our office at 1-866-TRAIN-IR, or you can email him at info at infraredtraining.com. And that training, by the way, is provided by Insight Fire Training. And we have on with us here this morning is Andy Starnes, uh, Insight's uh, instructor, a professional firefighter. Andy will be uh, first presenting on the base, sort of the basics of how infrared is used in the fire service, and then talking about some of the, you know, the benefits of that, why training is important. And then we'll have Jason Messerschmidt here on from FLIR Systems discussing equipment options, specifically the specifications of the different types of thermal imagers that are used uh, in firefighting applications. So first, I'll toss it to Andy. Uh, good morning, Andy. Good morning, Matt. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you for, for coming on here on short notice. We appreciate it. Uh, we've got a really great turnout here, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you've got to say about uh, IR and how it's used in firefighting applications. Thank you. We are looking forward to it as well. Well, you're okay to go ahead and share your screen if you want and uh, take it from there. I'll mute. And uh, we'll, you know, when you're ready, we'll toss to Jason here in a little bit. Okay. Let me know if you can see this okay once I get it pulled up here. And by the way, if we do have questions that come in during the presentation, you can ask those either via the chat icon at the bottom of your screen or send those in via the Q&A, and I'll read those back to both Andy and Jason here at the end. Y'all see the screen okay? Looks great. All right. So we're going to talk just a quick little overview of thermal imaging use in the fire service and uh, how that affects everyone from the firefighter to the citizen to uh, pretty much everybody involved in this whole world. So we'll share a little bit about that today. So we can start off with a little bit of uh, thermal imaging candy here from our recent training we did in the office simulator. So, um, so, so a lot of people will say, well, why does all this stuff have to even be talked about? Because thermal imaging cameras have been around for a while and they have, you know, it was actually discovered a long time ago, infrared energy by Sir William Herschel, but didn't start affecting us to the late nineties when they started being put in firefighters hands. And I say that jokingly because a lot of times those were these giant barrels or the Carnes Iris. And those of you who've been around long enough know uh, how big and bulky those things were. But as late as 2015, only 70% of the U S fire departments had a thermal imaging camera on every fire scene. Now that doesn't say what age, what type, uh, did they have any training on it? So it just shows that thermal imaging use in the fire service is not as widespread as it is as an industry. Uh, and prior to that, the other issue is, is a lot of, uh, if you work in industry, as Matt knows and Jason knows, you have to have at least 32 hours of training to be certified in level one thermography. Well, the fire service, they just handed you a camera, turn, told you how to turn it on and read the little number in the bottom right hand corner and said, have a nice day. There wasn't even an existing standard for training or how the cameras were to be built or interoperability, durability, or resolution until 2010 and 2015. NFPA 1801 covers how the camera is supposed to be built and designed. And NFPA 1408 is something that the majority of the fire service is not following. It's the only existing thermal imaging training consensus standard 
by the NFPA. I highly recommend you go and look at it. You can do it for free on their website. And it basically tells you that as you're using your camera, you use it on every application on the fire ground and how you should do that, how you should train in it. Uh, the majority of fire departments are not doing that. And I caution you about claiming exemptions to standards saying, well, we're going to claim an exemption to that. Well, if you have the money to buy a thermal imaging camera and you tell the somebody in court you didn't have enough money to train them on them, don't think that's going to work out too well. So let's talk about advancements in infrared and why it's not being used as much. The picture at the top is an older Scott Eagle attack, which is still on a lot of fire trucks today. But then the picture at the bottom here is a FLIR K65 made in 2016. The problem with a lot of thermal imaging use or the lack thereof is that firefighters have a poor impression or a bad taste in their mouth from older, poor resolution, lower uh, refresh rate cameras, where now we have newer, higher resolution cameras with a lot more features that are lighter weight and they produce better detail than they ever did in the past. So they're basing their perspective off the picture at the top when this is what we have now. It's like basing your whole TV experience on a, a black and white TV versus the smart TV. Uh, and the other thing is, is the majority of the U.S. Fire Service and internationally doesn't have training. Uh, we've had a lot of advancements in technology, but I would caution to say that more people know how to work their smartphone more, better than they know how to work a thermal imaging camera in an IDLH environment. And the only existing credential training program was the Law Enforcement Thermography Association prior to our tactical firefighting thermal imaging certification that's now credentialed through infrared training center. But this little picture right here on the right shows you some basic information that the majority of firefighters don't understand. And this should be required before it's put in your hand. Like you should know what high and low sensitivity means. You should know how to identify the thermal layer and when color engages on your camera. You should know what these icons mean, what that color bar means, and what that spot temperature means and when and when not to use it. The majority of firefighters are taught to use that spot temperature measurement in firefighting. And that, as Matt would tell you, is, is designed for specific quantitative usage, not qualitative where we're looking just for specific areas of problems or heat. Uh, one of the other things that's happened since fire, fire service ticks have come on the market is that now we have two primary types of cameras being marketed today. You have a situational awareness camera and you have a decision-making camera. And as I stated earlier, we don't have any training that's being standardized and pushed out all the time. So the issue is firefighters here, low cost and easily available. So they buy these on the left, these situational awareness ticks, and they start throwing out their handheld decision-making cameras. And that creates a lot of issues because these two were designed to work together. One wasn't designed to replace the other. The way it was supposed to work is a situational awareness tick is strictly designed to prevent firefighter disorientation. For example, FLIR makes two of those. You have a K1 and a K2. And then you see the other models here at the bottom, your Seek Fire Pro, your MSAI tick, your Scott site. Some of these are integrated in the air pack. Some of them are smaller and handheld. They're inexpensive. They're typically lower resolution. And something very important, two key things, low refresh rate, and they have a high thermal sensitivity, which means they won't be able to see finite details in certain temperatures. They're designed to get you out of a jam, not for 360s, uh, string placement, search, all the things that people are buying them and using them for incorrectly. It's like buying a hammer and saying everything's a nail. A decision-making camera is high resolution, fast processor rate, used for strategic decision-making. They're supposed to be in the decision-maker hand, by the way, the company officer. The company officer shouldn't turn the camera around and hand it to the firefighter in the back. The company officer is designed to watch over. So those are your two primary types. So you want to make sure that they're used in the proper context. One is for decision making. The other is on every firefighter in case they get in trouble to find their crew, find their way out. So what does this have to do, to you, do with you? Whether you know it or not, in industry, they have a whole program of building science thermography. And we've, what we've done is translated those fundamentals to firefighting. Everything you do, you can take a thermal imaging camera and enhance what you do. Or as my friend David Hinojosa says, it's a force multiplier. We can, we can enhance our size up, uh, where we make entry, as we move from one point to the other, our search, our stream placement, our search for firefighters, rapid intervention, and more. And these are just a few examples of what we cover in our curriculum. This picture on the right is a 640 by 480 FLIR drone mounted on a DJI drone. 
that's 150 feet off the ground and you can see the shingle pattern. Now you think about if you had that on a handheld, what kind of detail you would have. And this is not out of reach. This is not new. This was taken two years ago. Uh, so how can we enhance our size up as firefighters? You've probably heard a million times this one statement. So goes the first line, so goes the fire. Well, how did the first line get into place in the first place? Somebody sized that building up, whether it was the firefighter pulling the line off the back or the company officer, they looked at that building and they made an educated decision based on their training of where they were gonna stretch that line. Well, if you use the principles we teach and doing an enhanced size up, which we call a tactical 360, we're basically doing a hot lap or walking around the structure and taking our training and then our camera and putting those information together, where the fire is, where the fire might be going, where the victim might be, what's our best access. All of those things allow us to put that line into play. Here's an example. This is a pretty simple one. This is a college dormitory in Buchanan, West Virginia, where we have one dormitory on fire and the one next to it is not. Now, this is just an example of where training comes into play. I was taught I couldn't see through windows or glass with a thermal imaging camera. And that is mostly true. But what you need to understand is it still shows heat. So watch this video. We've got a low E glass or a double pane high efficiency uh, window. And then we have a standard college dormitory door with this white heat signature across the top. And we're going to look at this dormitory next door that's not on fire. This is our baseline, a normal heat signature. We don't see any major heat. The window's showing the reflected temperature of the cool air outside. We go back to the affected apartment. We see some thermal bridging around the top of the door and we see heat transfer coming through that glass. What's that telling you? That's where your fire is. Does that help you as a firefighter? Yeah, and that's just one short, quick little example of how an enhanced size up or a tactical 360 by using the camera can help firefighters. This is one from a fire I had right after I got promoted. You can see what was known as thermal bridging, where the joy star and where the fire is transmitted energy from the inside of the home, where it reached the ceiling, went into the attic, and we've got some heat transfer coming out the gable vent. But when the firefighters tell me they've got a control time and they've knocked the fire down, as a company officer outside, when I'm looking at this, I would say, okay, we need to check the attic, make sure we don't have any extension, and we would cool these until these heat signatures go away. These are many ways you can use this, but just, these are just a few examples of how thermal imaging in the fire service needs to be used. Company officers, the majority of them are not carrying their camera when they do their 360. 38% of all the line of duty deaths we read about, the camera stayed on the charger of the truck. So as my friend Joe DeVito says, it's thermal imaging is more than search and overhaul. This is an example of just looking at a roof uh, from my friends in Poland was taught that you couldn't look at metal objects. Well, that's not necessarily 100% true either as far as reading heat. Because if the metal is oxidized or rusted or has a flat matte surface, it's still gonna transmit energy. Matter of fact, metal transmits energy than just about anything or better than anything as far as the coefficient and the R value. Look at the heat transfer through this tin roof. You think you wanna step on that roof? Probably not, but look, I see some footprints over there. You know, and I'm, and I'm gonna make sure I'm stepping on Joyce, not in the hole in the middle. So these are just a few examples of looking at the building from the window to the roof. And this one right here is one of my favorite. How do I know I'm stepping on a lightweight truss versus a legacy style construction? Those of you who are my ladder company brothers and sisters understand that a, a roof ladder is approximately 20 inches wide. Huh, well, I'm not carrying a tape measure, but if I lay it between those joists and I look at it with my camera and it fits between them, those joists are wider, which means it's 24 inches on center, which means it's lightweight truss, which means this fails a lot faster under fire conditions. And you did that in less than 30 seconds. That's applying your fundamental training, using thermography, taking a quick look and making an educated decision. And like I showed you with a, a drone picture earlier, I want you to look at just the differences in roof texture. You can see there are fire departments going to tethered drones where the command vehicle pulls up, drone deploys, stays up indefinitely, provides constant information back to the IC. You're inside making a stop on the fire and you say, hey, we got it, we, we got a knock on the fire, we, we think we got it. And you see heat conditions moving from right to left getting worse. You would say, no, you don't. You can also see the ridgeline vent, you can see the chimney. You can also see where the roof transitions from shingle to tin roof. You can see the gables for void spaces. You can see so much more, as my friend and instructor uh, Thomas Anderson says, we're giving you your eyes back because you can't see infrared energy with the naked eye. Uh, when we make entry into a structure, this is one of the 
greatest areas we have trouble with is because we'll go through the front door nine times out of 10. But how about we define the hottest area and then the coldest area? Because that tells us where the fire is, where it's gonna go. It tells us some survivable spaces. We locate the fire, the severity of the fire, and the closest, quickest access route to the victim. My crew would go to the front door while I'm doing a 360. They take a quick look. If they identified a victim, because 12% of all fire attack victims are found within a few feet of the egress point, they would grab that victim and move them. But in this case, they would have to grab two victims. That's a mannequin lay on top of an infant. We did that on purpose. We had several incidents where parents have sacrificed themselves laying on top of their child. So we do these as spiritually relevant examples where the firefighter sees the value in it under relevant or more, more realistic uh, conditions so they can see the value in this. And they don't over rely on the device either. So let me ask you a question. When you make entry, I've heard this numerous times with other firefighters, they didn't open the nozzle. They're not carrying a camera. They got one, some of the best personal protective equipment they can wear today. And they say it wasn't hot. Well, what was the temperature of the last hallway you crawled? Because the person who lives there who's not wearing PPE, who's not wearing an SCBA, they're wearing pajamas, and they're laying on their couch or their bedroom would beg to differ with you if 300 degrees is at the ceiling and every time temperature doubles, radiation goes to the fourth power and it's radiating down their skin, it's bringing down that toxic gases and smoke and we crawl through that room and don't cool it. Firefighters are very particular about extinguishment. And what's not being measured is tenability and controlling that thermal environment. We teach that in our course about controlling each space using the camera as a guide to make that area more tenable, improve survivability for the victim, all by confirming our efforts before we move. It's a pretty simple process. I'm not asking you to be a level two thermographer, but if you take that type of training, you can now be what we call more intelligently aggressive. And the other issue is, is we're very extinguishment minded, but we don't think about we're crawling in a convection oven. You crawl through a room where you don't see fire, but yet this is occurring, what are the contents in that structure? And let's be honest, our, our stuff is made as cheap as possible. It's made of synthetics, it's high heat release rate fuels, and it starts to produce flammable vapors at 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And we just crawled past three couches, a chair, and an open front door. We completed the fire triangle, and we wonder why the fire lit behind us, yet the thermal imaging camera is hanging on our coat, and we're not looking both ways before we cross the street to measure, assess, communicate what we have, fix that problem, and then move forward. That's all it takes if you're well-trained in this particular science. And we don't recommend you just watch this and go do it. We want you to go get more training. But these are examples of how you can do that, okay? And, and from a pyrolysis perspective, everybody thinks about the contents, but you need to think about why controlling temperature and using thermal engine is more important. Human skin starts breaking down at 110 degrees. You say, ouch, at 113 degrees you get a burn at 130 degrees. The contents of your structure start to off gas at 200, and a firefighter's PPE starts breaking down between 160 and 290, and the highest temperature your PPE is tested at is 600 degrees Fahrenheit, and nobody has taught me ever to measure temperature, heat, and duration of exposure by using a diagnostic tool that can help me do that, because these eyes can't do that. So that's why we need it. That's why this is important. And then the other area we can, we can do a much better job, even though the American Fire Service is doing an extremely great job of what my friend Kyle Romagus says, an engine company resurrection of better hose deployment from nozzle forward to a lot of great instructors out there from my friend Jonas Smith to FD Tactics and Chief Reinwald. They're all doing tremendous work. But if we're not putting our water where the heat is, we're missing the target. So if we use the camera as a guide, we're more of a sniper. We're not just throwing water everywhere, spraying and praying. We're locating the fire faster. We're erasing the heat as we go, removing the threat and making it better for the victim. We're stopping the loss of their contents. So we're executing the life safety initiative, this loss of their property, and we're preserving as we go. Now, this is why it's important because you, let's be honest, we all make mistakes and all these videos I show you of mistakes are things that we've done. So if we check, fail to check our pattern and when there, as my friend Chief Ling says, screaming, shouting, spraying water all about, something like this could happen. We have a fire clearly to our right coming out the door, brand new firefighter, hasn't checked the pattern, opens a wide fog, circulates it around, 
just pulls air and heat back to me on the third person. I'm screaming, shut it down, shut it down. Well, did he put the fire out? No. Did we make it any more tenable? No. This could have all been fixed by checking it before we go in and using the camera to our advantage. So, and this is why it's so important. Instead of just flowing water and thinking we did a good enough job, how about we confirm it? We check, we communicate, we cool, we confirm, and we conquer. This is a standard 1403 burn through the eyes of a FLIR K65. This is the penciling technique that's taught everywhere. And I'm gonna show you why this is not effective because this little bit of water that's flown is not enough when you have leave 800 to 1,000 degrees of superheated surfaces behind you. They're not using a thermal engine camera. This is a new fire department, brand new gear, brand new fire trucks, brand new air packs. And the argument of we can't afford it goes out the window when I see a million dollar ladder truck and all this other equipment and you leave this much heat behind you to radiate down the victim, and the contents and everything else. This is why the camera's usage is so important because I wanna see my target from a long distance off, use the camera, see it, use the reach of the string, cool that environment and confirm it, and then move forward. This is what a military mindset would do. This is what an ind industry would do. They wouldn't guess. They use these tools to their best at their advantage. And finally, when we talk about search, you gotta realize the whole point of when we use thermal imaging cameras or when they were brought into this industry was to locate and find victims in low to zero visibility environments. Very few victims are found in high visibility because if they were easily found, we wouldn't need to go look for them, right? So over 75% of them were in low to zero visibility. So proper use of this device can help you find a victim faster. But you know what else? It's been proven. It never makes the papers that, hey, the firefighter rescued a victim, but it never puts in there just like you see in these three bullet points. And these are older saves that they located a two-year-old child trapped inside. They found the, the building was filled with smoke top to bottom. They went in and found a, did a sweep of the bed and found nothing, but then found a victim on top of the bunk and removed him because they used the camera. Using a tick, the firefighter noticed an arm of a seven-year-old child on the bottom bunk. All of this was made possible because they used the tools that they had that the taxpayer's dollars paid for. Remember that. They paid for it. We're expected to use it. And here's why we should really pay attention, because in the late 90s, they figured out if they trained firefighters to use a camera and they didn't use it, they mixed, missed the victim 60% of the time. If they used the, used the camera properly, they found the victim 99% of the time. They cut their search time in half, and every minute, and you can look this up on firefighterrescuesurveys.com, every minute a, fire, a person's left in there, their chances of survivability drop by 10%. And this is what an actual victim looks like in a fire. If you're training your firefighters in cold, wet smoke, the fake smoke stuff that you buy in the little droplet uh, container, you're setting them up for failure because the majority of the time they're heating up victims. A victim that's 98.6 degrees in a fire environment will not show up white hot. It's a thermal inversion problem. They're gonna be the coldest thing in the room if the room's 300 degrees. And this is a quick example of two firefighters searching or crew leaders leading their, their crew, one on the left, is leading one room search, and it takes him the same amount of time by not employing the right tactics as the one on the right who searches three rooms with two firefighters using the tactics we show with the cameras. He's holding the camera at a different angle called an increased field of view, what we call the gangster grip, flipping it sideways. He's in a tactically and advantageous position between three rooms. He sent one firefighter in one room, one in the other. He's checking on their progress. As one clears a room, it comes out and sends them to the next one. His goal, his job, his or her job, is to be the designated goal or the supervisor, watching over, directing, and facilitating. Look what happens when he directs them to the problem, finds the victim. This is my good friend and fellow instructor Thomas Anderson's work we did in Buchanan, West Virginia. So the whole point of all this rambling is my little 25-minute, 30-minute sermon is when you use tactical thermal imaging, it's tactical meaning task oriented, you're able to control the thermal environment, improve the victims of chances of survivability, locate the victim faster, locate and extinguish the fire faster. You can improve the tenability of the overall environment, prevent rapid fire development and thermal insult to your firefighters, but yet we're not upgrading our technology and we're not carrying the camera. If you have an older camera, after you watch this today, or your department's not currently trained or not using it, I highly encourage you, whether you talk to me, Infrared Training Center, or whoever, get training. 
You wouldn't let your 16 year old go get in the car without with keys, with no training, no driver's ed and say, good luck, best of luck to you. Well, we shouldn't give you a very expensive device that requires training and say, you just turn it on and read the little number down there. And if you want more of that, we have up to 32 hours of that training. We partnered with Infrared Training Center, as uh, Matt was talking about in the beginning. And here's my contact information, which we'll share again at the end. And I uh, greatly appreciate your time. I will stop share here if I hit the right button and hand it back over to Matt. Great. Thank you very much, Andy. Great information. Appreciate it. No problem. Hope that was had a uh, questions coming in about uh, the recording. Yeah, we are recording the presentation. We'll have this available for playback here a little bit later today on our YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash infrared training. And then there's a sort of a sub playlist there, uh, infrared webinars, and I'll put that right at the front of that playlist. So uh, we will put that up here later today. Uh, Jason, welcome. We've got Jason Messerschmidt from FLIR Systems on with us. Uh, how yes, are Matt, you? How are you today? I'm doing well. Thanks Good, for being man. here. Good. Thank you for having me. We're going to chat a little bit about the equipment, I think, and really the important specifications to consider for buying a camera. Is that right? Yes, sir. That's what we're, uh, that's what we're going to address. We'll address that and a couple other things. I'm going to start sharing my screen here and uh, make sure that everybody can see the slideshow. We seeing it good, Matt? Looks good. Excellent. Thanks. So <clears throat> my name is Jason Messerschmidt. I am the uh, Public Safety Solution Sales Manager for FLIR Systems for the Americas. Um, so uh, we're gonna go over a couple things, including some uh, the high level specifications that we want to be looking at when we're actually purchasing these cameras that Andy has been talking about uh, and what, what does best where. Uh, one thing I, I do wanna talk about very briefly is we're, we're getting, and myself and Mr. Starnes have been seeing this on social media and everywhere else. Um, you know, one of the unfortunately bad things that's happening today with COVID-19, you know, people are attempting to utilize certain products to detect elevated body temperature. And I, if I don't get this phone call 50 times a day, I don't get it at all. So, you know, one of the biggest questions we get is, is, you know, Andy talked about temperature measurement and the inaccuracy of temperature measurement of fire series thermal imaging cameras. And one of the big questions is, is can I use my K-series to detect elevated body temperature when we're doing emergency situations and trying to scan people in some way, shape or form? Uh, and the big resounding answer is no. Um, you know, the fixed focal, fixed focal, the temperature inaccuracy, all these things combined when you're trying to get to very minute levels of accuracy, the, the K-series camera and fire service cameras in general just don't allow for that particular thing to happen. So FLIR does build very specific cameras that are that have these capabilities that we have FDA approvals to utilize for elevated body temperature screening. As you can see from this list, the K series is absolutely not one of them. So please, you know, just uh, a public safety announcement type thing. You know, the K series is not uh, within accuracy to detect elevated body temperature. But this is just something I wanted to push out there because we're getting phone calls due to the situation that we're in all across the United States and across the world. Um, you know, just not something that that camera is capable of. So <clears throat> Andy talked uh, about decision making cameras and situational cameras. And, you know, at FLIR we have we have both of those particular products in those two particular categories. Uh, the top portion of this particular slide shows our wide array of decision making cameras, uh, K33s through K65, which is our NFPA 1801 uh, compliant imager. And then we have our K1s and K2s at the bottom, which are our situational imagers. Some of the very high level things that you want to look at when you're looking at these two particular categories, you know, our, our K33 and above starts at a 240 by 180. Uh, pixel imager. So we got a K33 and a K45 that have 240 by 180s. And then we have a K53, 55, and 65 that both have uh, 320 by 240. 
One of the big things that they also have uh, is a 60 hertz uh, frame rate, refresh frame rate, uh, which makes a much more fluid image. Uh, think about when you want to watch football on television, you don't want to watch it on a, you don't want to watch it on a four hertz TV. Uh, you want a, a very high refresh rate to be able to keep up with the action. And that's exactly what the higher decision making cameras do to you. Uh, the K1 and the K2, both are 9 hertz cameras, and they're both lower resolution cameras as well. They're both 160 by 120. Uh, so some of the big differences between these two particular categories, when you're looking at your decision-making cameras in our upper echelon of the K33 and above, and then your K1s and K2s, the K33s and above have what we call FSX, which is a flexible scene enhancement which really pulls out the ridge detail and gives you those nice crisp images that Andy was showing earlier, where you can see ridge lines and you can see you know, the, the brick and mortar and you can see all these boundaries and things that you're looking for in really high detail. That's what FSX does for us. The smaller uh, situational type cameras has a patented program that we call MSX, multi-spectral enhancement. Uh, in a very short version of what that is, is uh, on the 160, 120, K1 and K2, we actually take a visual image and overlay it on top of that thermal base. So if you look at the front of either of those two cameras, you'll actually see two lenses. You'll see a IR lens and you'll actually see a visual lens. On the K33s and above, you're only going to see that pure thermal IR lens. And then the flexible scene enhancement that is coming in the background is happening, you know, without you doing anything, it's just enhancing the image as you go. You know, one of the big things that I see from a sales standpoint all the time is, is we do demos and we do them in, you know, in the boardroom, in the truck room, wherever, you know, it's such a firehouse. Not everybody has access to, you know, live burn facilities, acquired structures are, are even harder to come by today to evaluate cameras. And the one thing that I can't stress enough is, when you're evaluating cameras, whether it's mine or anybody else's, doing the due diligence of, you know, actually going out and being able to see these cameras operate in the environment that you want to operate them in. We spend a ton of time sending cameras all over the country for live burn evaluations. It's something we highly encourage. You know, a, a camera can look great in the chief's office or the, you know, the kitchen at the firehouse or wherever. And, you know, it looks something totally different when you actually get it out into the environment that it's meant to be utilized in. Uh, volunteer myself, uh, I live in Pennsylvania, and I remember vividly uh, years back that we were getting called mutual aid to another county, another department, because we had a thermal imager and that particular department did. And, uh, you know, that was when thermal imaging was costing $25,000, $20,000 you know, the, the cost effect of thermal imaging is, you know, allowing us to deploy thermal imagers like nobody ever has in fire service before. You know, you can buy a K55 and several K2s or several K1s and put them on the, on the back end crew and have everybody outfitted with thermal imaging cameras for less than what you paid for one, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And it's, uh, it's, it's an advancement in the fire service. It has created some confusion in regards to what I should have where. Uh, as Andy was speaking about, you know, the, the K2 doesn't belong in the officer seat. It shouldn't be your primary camera. You know, K33 and higher for that. You know, the, the K1 and the K2 are more as what we would refer to as a backseat situational type camera. Um, you know, it's an added set of eyes. It's, uh, it's, it may be your only eyes at that particular point in time, but it's better than having nothing, you know, and, and when we see departments outlaying cameras, you know, that's what we, we truly want to see. Uh, you know, my entire staff is in some way intertwined with fire service, whether it's volunteer, or they're retired or whatever, you know, they've been intertwined with the fire service and, and we want to see the right product go into the right position. So we really want to see people putting that decision-making camera in the right hands of the officer and then the K1s and the K2s, you know, back in the back seat where they truly belong. Uh, and, you know, we want to avoid the phone calls of people getting a K2 and buying it as their one and only primary imager and being unhappy with the performance because they're trying to do something with it that it truly just wasn't designed for. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things where when you're looking at the decision-making cameras, you know, 240, 180 and higher, 60 hertz. You know, you're looking at your situational cameras like the K1s and the K2s. 
you're at a nine hertz nine hertz camera and a 160 by 120 um, and you know that's really the arena that you want to live in uh, very quickly we have some things going on that i know everybody likes a deal uh, so you know we'll pass this around i know andy's been sharing it i've been sharing it on social media so this will be a part of the presentation you'll be able to have access to that one thing I want to touch on is, is this is becoming part of our day to day lives. Andy showed a, Andy showed a picture of a UAS with, I believe it was probably an XT2, uh, 640 camera on a, uh, on a UAV, on a drone, uh, and from above, you know, giving you that different point of view. You know, this is one of those things where, you know, sooner or later in my lifetime, there will probably be a drone on the top of my firehouse that gets dispatched at the same time I do and is flying to the scene and giving me relative data back while I'm in the fire truck on my way to the scene. And uh, the technology exists, the government regulations just haven't quite caught up with uh, able to use it that way. But, you know, FLIR has a wide variety of things where we have products that are plug and play with DJI, uh, Matrice platforms. And then we have products that you can add to other people's platforms and also, you know, drones that some people just build themselves. Uh, with, you know, that's where you're getting into the view, the view pro and the duo pro where you're doing some integration on your own. And uh, our infrared training center has done a fantastic job with their uh, SUAS level one course. It's a very popular course, Matt will touch on it, but it's a very popular course that I believe fills up just about every single time that they have one to offer because UAS is just truly becoming a part of our day-to-day -day lives and the added thermal capability to the UAS just gives you a whole different line of sight and a whole different situational awareness of the scene. Not just for, you know, people think about SUAS and just say, well, we just use it for search and rescue, but situational awareness, being able to see the roof, being able to see deployed assets, you know, where things are. You saw the detail in Andy's picture of the 640 camera on the UAS platform. And it's just, you know, it's unbelievable what we have the ability to do today. And then <clears throat> last but not least, one thing that we get asked a lot uh, is, you know, can I use my fire service K55 uh, to be utilized to go out and do search and rescue, uh, outdoor search and rescue, where you're trying to see 100 yards down the road and, you know, 300 yards down the road and try to find somebody in a cornfield or something to that effect. You know, the, the K-series cameras are built with uh, lenses that are meant to work best in a 10 by 15, 20 by 20 room environment to give you a very wide field of view to be able to see as much of that room as you're searching as humanly possible all at one particular point in time. What that does is that, you know, that lowers its ability to see very far. So we have very specific cameras that FLIR builds that are fantastic for search and rescue when you're, you know, if you're out on a boat and you're looking for somebody on a shoreline or if you're out doing uh, a search and rescue, God forbid somebody walks away from a home where you get a lost hunter or something like that and you're trying to see 100 yards in a cornfield or, or something like that, that your K-series camera is not going to work very great for that in particular environment. You know, unfortunately with the way the technology works and the lenses and, you know, the the downsides to certain cameras are the upsides to other cameras. There is no silver bullet, so to speak, of one camera that can do all the different things that you want it to do, like search and rescue, uh, outdoor search and rescue, uh, you know, indoor stuff, and also be either a situational or decision-making camera. There's unfortunately no silver bullet that there's a camera that exists today that does all those things. There are, however, very specific cameras for very specific uses that we utilize as first responders. So with that said, Matt, I think I'm right on schedule, right at about 15 minutes here. So I'm going to turn it back over to you to uh, get the finalization of stuff in there. Great. Thank you, Jason. Great information. As we wrap up here, we have some time to take some questions. I saw Andy answering a few of those. We'll read those back here. But if you want to send your question in, you can do that either via the chat window or the question icon at the bottom of the screen. Go ahead and submit those right now, and we'll get to those. Uh, Jason had mentioned uh, the SUAS. And I just, if you want more on that, you can go to our website at infraredtraining.com schedule, and that'll take you to our upcoming training schedule. Uh, we're 
at the moment sort of on a hiatus with, with live training, obviously, uh, but as we return to our in-person certification courses here, hopefully coming up here later in May, uh, we are offering some SUAS level one certification classes, and those are available uh, throughout the U.S., and uh, you can find all of those at infraredtraining.com slash schedule. If you want to follow ITC and get the very latest information on when we've got upcoming courses, uh, special training offers, when we have, let's say, a tactical level one firefighting class coming up, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, Instagram, all of these channels here uh, for the latest information from the Infrared Training Center and our classes that we're running in conjunction with Insight uh, Fire Training at Andy Starnes. I mentioned we've recorded today's session. That'll be available off of our YouTube channel here a little bit later on, probably towards this evening at youtube.com slash infrared training. And then finally, just to again, plug uh, the Insight fire training that we're offering with Andy Starnes. Uh, you really can save a lot with an on-site option. If you have any questions about the pricing on that, please call Alex in our office at 1-866-TRAIN-IR, or you can email him at info at infraredtraining.com. So with that, I'll leave that up for the moment. And I actually had some questions here. Uh, a couple that came in, Tyler was asking this, and I saw Andy, you replying as well. Maybe just briefly, I don't know who wants to take this, uh, but just a quick summary again of uh, a situational awareness camera or a decision-making camera. Specifically, Tyler was asking about the K53. Is that for situational or for decision-making? You want me to answer Jason or? Oh yeah, go ahead, Andy. Okay, I mean, if you look at the FLIR series line from a K33 to a K65 would incorporate your decision-making cameras. <clears throat> I typically don't say anything less than 320 by 240 resolution because that one, that's the NFPA standard, and two, it allows you to see a small child's hand at approximately 15 feet and detect, recognize, and identify it. But the K33 has something called FSX that Jason mentioned earlier, and when I compare 320 by 240 lower cost cameras, the K33 outperforms them and, and is performing at a 320 by 240 <clears throat> level. The K53 is uh, one of my favorites when it comes to decision making because I'm a one button camera fan. I don't like lots of buttons because I think firefighters think it's an Xbox game and we start to push <laughs> buttons and get in trouble. So I like buttons for teaching, but for training and, and whatnot, we want to be able to turn it on and go to work. So the K53 is an excellent option. Turn it on, go to work, records, provides the same resolution as the more expensive K65, but it is not NFPA compliant in the fact that it's not intrinsically safe, uh, but it is a great camera to use for decision making. And just to add a little color to uh, Andy's, you know, coming from the volunteer fire service uh, where I come from and live in Pennsylvania, you know, we, you know, when we talk about one button cameras, I'm as well a huge fan of a one button camera. Uh, it's a simple on off procedure. The camera doesn't do any type of additional modes or anything like that. When you talk about a K33 or K53, you know, when in the volunteer service, you know, like my firehouse, we run 300 calls a year, you know, 10, five to 10% of that is, is structure fires where there's actual fire. Um, you know, and at three o'clock in the morning, when my guys need that camera, I don't want them to have to remember a whole lot with the exception of turning it on and, and starting to use it and getting the information that they need. I don't need them. I don't want them to care about what mode they're in, if it's the right mode for the situation or whatever, you know, that K33 and 53 with the single button operation, just on off and a, and a TI basic mode. You know, I, I love those two particular options and, you know, they are for sure some of our most popular cameras in regards to what we see in sales and throughout the course of the year. And I think for a lot of the same reasons that I just mentioned. Good. I, you know, I had a question that came in and it's related to this and it was from one of the attendees and, and maybe we've touched on it, but wondering about a situal, uh, situal way, awareness camera and identifying a victim. And is there any different consideration for identifying, let's say, a person who has dece is deceased or a victim who succumbed to their injuries. Uh, is any, any differentiation there with that? Yes, sir. And it has to come down to uh, the camera itself, how it performs in an environment when you're looking at a victim. As Jason said earlier, you got to think about a couple things in situational awareness camera. Number one is going to be lower resolution typically. So that's less pixels on target. 
So most of them are uh, 160 by 120, so that's 19,000 pixels compared to what we just mentioned, the K53 is four times that. So that's like going from a black and white TV to a smart TV and then going back to the black and white TV and searching for the victim. What you'll see is when you look at a victim in a 160 by 120, when you're too far away, you won't be able to detect them very well. They'll look like a blob or like the, the uh, character Pong on Atari when that first came out because you don't have enough pixels to formulate an image. That's what the military calls DRI. I got enough pixels to detect it, got enough pixels to recognize it's a person, and I got enough pixels to identify, oh, that's a child, and they're laying on the floor looking this way. So the lower the resolution, the less it lessens your ability to detect. For example, 160 by 120, you will not be able to identify a small child's hand outside of seven feet. Okay, so when you get into the 320 by 240, you're at 15 feet. 388 by 284, you're at 20 feet. 640 by 480, you're at 175 feet. Look at the difference. Every time we go up four times in resolution. So situational awareness can help you, but you got to realize that's not what it's designed for. And when you look at a victim with that, that's your first problem. Second problem is refresh rate. If they're nine hertz and you're scanning from right to left and the camera lags and shutters and freezes right there at that point that you were looking, and then it catches up at another point six feet away, you just mix, miss that six foot range in between. So that would be a very, a big detriment for that. Um, the other issue is the thermal sensitivity of the camera, which is known as NETD or MRTD, noise equivalent temperature differential or minimal, minimal resolvable temperature difference. And what that means in layman's terms is the ability of the camera to detect a, like a 98.6 degree vic victim versus a 99 degree pile of clothes. It can differentiate between the two. So if that camera's number on that NETD or MRTD is very low, which NFPA says less than 80, you're going to be able to see that victim better. Most situational awareness cameras are 100 millikelvin or higher. So when you scan in a high heat environment, you're going to see a dark area down low and the heat source up above. You're not going to see a victim very well until you're right on top of them, if that helps. <clears throat> And one, you know, adding a little bit of color, if you look at our particular cameras, and we, we do this when we do demos all the time, myself and, you know, my sales staff, you know, we have the, we have the program called MSX. So it's the multi-spectral enhancement. And it, it, there's a lot of key attributes and, and key situations where that comes in very, very handy and can be utilized as a tool. One of the things that we'll have people say to us all the time, well, you got this $1,385 K2 and you hold it next to a K55 in a boardroom where there's lots of visible light and things like that. And that K2 from the image that you see on the screen in the boardroom actually looks better than you see in, uh, than you see in the K55. You know, one thing to remember is that you're using a visual overlay on that particular, those lower end situational cameras that we build. So when we're doing things like demos and stuff and we don't have the opportunity to go into a, a, a you know, a, a heated environment where there's no light and things like that, we take our fingers and we'll put them over that visible lens and you can see what a true 160 by 120 image looks like in comparison to an MS, MSX enhanced image. You know, and it's just, it's one of those things that we want to make people aware of and we want to, you know, put everything out on the table because sometimes that helps them make the decision, oh, I'll just buy this K2 because it looks better in my office. But when you get it into the environment that you're going to be using it in, you can definitely see the need as to why that is not a decision-making camera and that, you know, you need, there's still a true need for that KXX camera, that K33 and higher when you hold them side by side in that true environment. But it, it can be a little can be a little confusing, and we want to make sure that we spend the time to show people that and tell people that when we're actually evaluating cameras. I had a, a question came in from David. Uh, how much thermal imaging has been done in, in the UL fire attack studies? Do you know? Yes, sir. Um, if you go back further than UL, where, where NIST was the primary one, it starts farther back than that. If you want an interesting name when you're looking at Google, Look up Bruce Farner. He's one of the head of the committees. He's been on every thermal imaging study that I've seen. Uh, look up Bob Athenis with Safe IR. He's on every one of those. But you'll see it starts as far back as 2006, 2004 in that range. You'll see NIST studies on uh, thermal imaging cameras, on spatial resolution, thermal classifications for first responders. You'll see them on the performance metrics, which is where NFP 1801 came from. 
You'll see one on structural integrity. You'll see one on thermal imaging cameras. The most recent one that was released was by their intern on the use of the spot temperature. Actually, there's a lot of uh, the areas in there I'd like to qualify, but I mean, good material overall. The fire attack studies typically don't have a whole lot of thermal imaging information in them. Uh, they have yet to put an industrial thermographer on there. I would love to see ITC oh. get involved with that. I but think that's a job for Matt. Like, yes, a great job for Matt. <laughs> I agree. Um, we need somebody who's uh, not, not connected directly to the fire service, but has the exceptional knowledge of the thermal imaging side to say, yes, that will work. No, it won't. Um, but yes, there's a lot of information. If you'll email me after the webinar, I have a list of those papers. Uh, actually, as part of my required reading for my instructor cadre, it's about 3,000 pages. And there's uh, several of them on there that you can easily find on the internet. I had one more question that had come in, and it looks like both you and Andy and Jason had answered uh, the gentleman, uh, but he was just asking about the K33 versus the 53 being, you know, what options to consider uh, for, you know, they're, they've got a budget and how they're going to decide how best to spend uh, funding. I guess, any questions on that? Best way to get in touch with you, Jason, probably? If uh, yeah, I, uh, I retyped uh, re an answer, gave him my email and my cell phone. And, you know, we, we, we live in a world where, where sometimes budget rules are decisions, you know, and, and, you know, the K33 being uh, an acceptable option, you know, definitely a, a good, okay for decision-making cameras. And when, when budget gets into effect, you know, we don't live in a world of unlimited budgets, unfortunately. Uh, you know, we'd all be driving Ferraris or Porsches or whatever that may be, but that's just simply not the case. So I know that plays a big role in, you know, in your decision, your decision capability of, you know, what do I buy compared to what can I afford to buy? So I'd love to talk to you more about that. I did put my email address and my cell phone number in there. So I'd be more than happy to talk to you afterwards as well. Great. And we can also, we can chat that out as well. Um, uh, we look good. I think I've, I think we've gotten through all the questions here on this end. Uh, Jason, just just to wrap up, anything else you want to say, just in terms of you know equipment? Well, uh, you know, it's it's great to see. Uh, unfortunately, we're all kind of stuck in our houses, safe at home, uh, right? Uh, right, everybody. So you know, this is a great time to do things like this, and I'm I'm very thankful to be able to do it. Thank Andy very much for his partnership. Uh, I learn things from Andy every time I listen to him talk. Uh, great, great friend, great brother, um, you know, looking forward to doing more and more of this, uh, getting on and just chatting about, you know, fire service and thermal imaging and all the things that have changed over time. And it's, it's just a great, great to be part of it. Thank you very much, Matt, for the invite. Oh, you're very welcome. It's great to have you on. Uh, and likewise, Andy, as well, as we wrap up here, uh, anything you wanted to say with uh, just you know, in terms of training and, and, and firefighting applications? You're on mute, Andy. There you go. How about that? Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. In, in general, just whatever you do when you when you go to do any kind of new thing to you, whether it's you're a firefighter and you've been on the fire service ten years, twenty years, or fifteen years, or two years, if you don't have experience with a particular tool or tactic or concept, seek out the subject matter experts. Seek out training. Doesn't have to be me or any, but just get good training and get as much. You know, if you don't use us, that's fine. We will get you to somebody but my point is is we want you to get trained don't use a device without training i highly recommend infrared training centers i highly recommend the training we're doing I, i've got good friends who teach around the country and we've got it broken down where you can get training through our social media stuff that's free you can look at our youtube channel it's like 300 videos our facebook page we have a private group called tactical thermal imaging you can ask questions on there you have to hit join group we let you in i don't allow spam or politics or any of that stuff. It's all thermal imaging. Uh, then we also have our website where we have blogs where we post basically, basically, believe it or not, when you ask a question, a lot of times the question becomes an article. So it's a long response. So we post it there. And then we have a subscription service for about 20 bucks a month. You can watch all our pre-recorded webinars. And then we also do live webinars, some of them free, some of them for about $30 a person, depending on sponsorship and whatnot. And then obviously we have up to a 32 hour training with infrared training center. And we do customized live fire training for municipalities. We've been to 43 States now in several countries. We'd be glad to help you out. Hey, uh, Andy, just a, a, a quick added color to Andy's commentary. You know, we, we all struggle to find places, unfortunately, where we can actually do live fire training. 
where we can, you know, either have an acquired structure or actually have a building that we can do go to that's a, you know, a, a training building. You know, friend, friends of ours, uh, Sean at Max Firebox has a fantastic uh, device that, you know, really brings live training to your parking lot at your firehouse. Uh, if you have a chance, check out, check out Sean's. It's just maxfirebox.com, right, Andy? Yep, and Sean and I are good friends and business partners, and you need to understand that, as, as Jason said, one of the issues we've had is a lot of people want to do live fire training, so they want to get a good, you know, kind of compliment in between. You get a max firebox, you can roll it out from your bay, and you can do everything we talked about in one of our intro classes in about an hour outside. They're engaged. It's not a PowerPoint. They got their cell phones out. They got their cameras out. They're playing with fire. They've got squirt bottles or water application bottles, as Sean likes to call it. Yeah. And you can do so much with it that you don't get in the classroom. Classroom is necessary, but we're all kinesthetic learners. We got to touch it, taste it, break it, you know, before we understand it. <laughs> so uh, we definitely appreciate the shout out for Sean and Max Firebox. And uh, it's I've, I've got over 300 burns in the unit I have. So it's a very high quality product. He named it after his son. Uh, it, it's a beast. It weighs a ton and it ain't going to break. And if it does, he guarantees it for life. So if you use his fuel load, so I, I highly recommend it. It's a great yeah. teaching tool and you don't have to build a dollhouse. Yeah. And as the world changes, unfortunately, you know, it becomes harder and harder to be able to do live fire trading, you know, in the environments we need to do them in to keep our skills up to date. So it, it's, you know, it's, back to basics and gets you something that you know you don't have easy access to all the time today so just wanted to bring that up because i know it was something that we talked about a couple times and you know sean found a great way of bringing the bringing that live fire to your parking lot of your firehouse absolutely thank you again no great thank you jason and thank you andy really appreciate it uh, jason messerschmidt of flare systems andy starns of insight fire training uh great information glad to have you on uh, if you want to contact Jason, I put his email into the chat box. Uh, Andy, if you want to throw your email in there as well, I'll leave it up for a little bit so people can contact you if you have questions. If you want to get set up with uh, training through Insight Fire Training with the Infrared Training Center, uh, you can contact Alex in our office here at this information, uh, info at infraredtraining.com, or uh, give us a call. Well, we'll have to do this uh, again at some point. All right. Absolutely. We'll call it a day here. Uh, thank you for watching, everyone. We've got more live webinars coming up in the coming weeks here throughout the month of April here at the Infrared Training Center. If you want to find the very latest on what topics are coming up, you can follow us on social media, uh, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Instagram, where we're posting uh, updates and announcements there. And finally, just one reminder that we have recorded today's presentation, and we'll have it here uh, available for playback a little bit later today off our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash infrared training. Again, for Jason Messerschmidt, Andy Starnes, I'm Matt Schwegler with the Infrared Training Center. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you online again soon.